She was a promising young research scientist who thought she found her perfect match. She was very well liked in the community and at work. He was like the office stud. Their relationship was progressing. Maybe this is meant to be. But this office romance wouldn't have a fairy tale ending. There's bloody handprints on the walls. There's blood smeared on the floor. The violence was so over the top that it had to have some personal connection. The ensuing investigation would reveal that Mr. Wright wasn't as perfect as he appeared to be. And someone had decided to make him pay for it. And I was like, is there a female serial killer? What's going on here? The person who committed this murder had a score to settle. They chose violence. Bloody, bloody violence. Friday, November 8, 2002. It's a quiet afternoon in the picturesque harbor area of Stamford, Connecticut. Until 12.13 p.m., when local police receive a disturbing 911 call. Stamford, please. Hello? Yes, hello. I think a guy is, is a, attacked my neighbor. I saw a guy go into her apartment. The 911 dispatch asks her, what is your neighbor's name? She doesn't know her name, but what she does know is the number of the door. I don't know her name, but the guy was there. There in the bathtub. I heard yelling, I heard yelling. Okay. What are you, you don't know your, hello? Hello? The call cuts off abruptly at that point. They don't know if she hung up, got disconnected, or if she could be in danger as well. Officers are immediately dispatched to the apartment identified by the caller. This is a upper-level condominium on the waterfront. They have docks there. It's a, a very nice neighborhood. So you're not prepared for what you're going to see when you open that door. They enter the apartment and find the body of a dead woman inside. The victim was lying just inside the threshold of the door, and there was a tremendous amount of blood. We felt that definitely a stabbing was involved. We could look at the victim, and even without additional information from the medical examiner, you could see a number of stab wounds about the chest and neck area. The officers quickly secure the area and call for backup. Considering the location, they knew this was going to be a high-profile case. When I first got down there, uh, there was a lot of police, and the area was taped off, and it was hard to get information. Police weren't giving anything, but I do remember a source of mine slipping me a note. By the next morning, the victim's face is all over the news. She is a beautiful 32-year-old research scientist named Anna Lisa Raimondo. Annalisa Raimondo was born to Filipino parents who immigrated into this country. Wonderful people. Her father was a doctor. Mother was a professional. She was just a go-getter. Came from a family with very high standards. And I think not only did they want the best for her, but she fought to have the best for herself. Attended Harvard, attended Columbia for graduate school, you know, and just kind of the apple of her parents' eye. After finishing her degrees, Annalisa could have pursued a career anywhere in the country, but she decided to stay in Connecticut. She had her pick, and she chose to go into pharmaceutical research, and she was one of the best at her job. She worked at Purdue Pharma, this big company, right downtown Stanford. She wanted to help people and make the world a better place, but pharmaceuticals are also big business. By her late 20s, she had made enough money to buy herself a condo in Chapon. She was just climbing the ranks and making a wonderful life for herself. Annalise's devotion to her job left little time for relationships, so it wasn't surprising that she fell in love with a co-worker. So while uh, working at Purdue Pharma, she met a man by the name of Nelson Sessler, who worked there as well. 
He was tall, handsome, and he was like the office stud, and everybody had a crush on him. They started out as friends and then began dating casually at first. But by the summer of 2002, the romance between Annalisa and Nelson had become more serious. Their relationship was progressing. He was spending the night quite a bit at her condo. Employees definitely knew them as a couple. When there was a work function, they were together. They went out together. They did dinners together. They're making good money, and everything appeared that it was a good relationship. For Annalisa, I mean, she really felt like this was going to be her husband, like they were going to get married. But the couple's plans for the future would never be realized. 32-year-old Annalisa has been found murdered in her waterfront condominium, and the entire community wants to know why. Leading the investigation into this high-pressure case is Captain Richard Conklin. The minute you enter that apartment, the crime scene is all there. Different items that had been knocked about. One of the more bloody scenes I had ever seen. One of the first things they want to do is find the 911 caller. She had hung up so abruptly, you know they had to be thinking the worst, that maybe she was a victim as well. Someone called 911, and that person who called 911 said they were a neighbor. Who is it? Well, what happens is, when they begin to send out other investigators and start looking at tracing the call, what they find is kind of strange. We find that the call came from a payphone about a half mile from this crime scene. If this caller's life is in danger, it would make sense for her to get away and call from someplace safe. But if she had done so, why didn't she just say that? They alleged that they were a witness to this disturbance. And, uh, you know, these are the things that were racing through our mind. You know, why didn't this person identify themselves? I think there were some red flags that immediately went up at that point. Immediately, we had to come up to speed very quickly. Who was this victim? What were we dealing with? Who might have done this to her? Coming up. Crime scene investigation reveals clues about the killer. Stabbing someone is a crime of passion. You have to have some real deep feelings to kill someone that maliciously. Under intense media scrutiny, Connecticut police have begun an investigation into the murder of 32-year-old research scientist Annalisa Raimundo. We're knocking on doors, uh, you know, we're doing computerized checks as to that residence. Has there been different disturbance calls there? Have they called for police services prior? All these are going on at one time and very, very rapidly. Mind you, this is still early in the afternoon on a work day, so many of her neighbors weren't home. The few that were home reported hearing nothing. The 911 call has been traced to a nearby payphone, but the caller's identity is still unknown. We send people to process this area. Uh, at that time, they didn't have security cameras trained on that outside payphone. It's uh, difficult to get straight up fingerprints off of it because there's so many people handling these payphones back at that point. Police canvass the other businesses in the area, hoping someone saw the caller, but they come up empty-handed. Meanwhile, a team of forensic specialists is busy processing the condominium for evidence. I can't really describe how frantic you are in the beginning of a high-level homicide like this and the number of tasks you're undertaking at one time. Soon after seeing this scene, I, I made a decision and it's one I've only made a couple times in my entire career. We decided to call in the state police major crime unit. DNA was just starting to be a wonderful tool for law enforcement. And when we saw what a bloody crime scene this was, we really wanted to preserve the scene. And you only get one chance, one shot, at processing a crime scene. If you don't do it well, you lose the evidence. 
What they would have seen standing from the foyer, basically, is a female victim who appears to be 25 to 35. Long black hair, kind of lying on the ground. There's bloody handprints on the walls, and there's, there's blood smeared on the floor. There was no forced entry. The lock was in, in good shape. Uh, it hadn't been tampered with. So you have to think that perhaps someone knocked or rang the doorbell and our victim answered the door and then either allowed someone entry or someone kind of pushed their way through at that point. And then it looked like just it, immediately a life and death struggle took place. Annalisa's injuries provide a terrifying summary of the attack. It was a very violent struggle. There was glass broken. Annalisa was smashed over the head with an object and also stabbed several times in the face and neck, chest. Stabbing someone is a crime of passion. You have to be angry with someone or have some real deep feelings to kill someone that maliciously. And she was stabbed nine times. The dumbbell on the ground has hair and it has blood on it. So they know that that dumbbell was used in this crime in some way. Annalisa's skull had been fractured by a heavy blow, and she had been stabbed a total of nine times to the face, neck, and chest. One of the stab wounds had even reached the back of her lung. Thankfully, there was no sign of sexual assault. No, this was a prolonged attack, but whatever edged knife or weapon was used was not left at the scene. We could not locate that in that area. Further inspection also reveals a trail of blood leading away from the body. You can see bloody footprints and smudges going all the way to the bathroom. So for investigators, that bathroom becomes a focal point. There was some blood, a droplet of blood, as they described it, on the sink handle in the bathroom there uh, near the entryway. We kind of felt that someone might have washed up there because it would be odd, you know, to find that blood on that fixture like that. Police are hopeful the DNA will help identify Annalisa's killer. But what prompted the attack? You make some assessments as you're going along. Could someone had uh, attempted to burglarize this location and didn't realize that she was home? But as we look through the apartment, there's so many valuables left around. Uh, the place isn't ransacked. There's silverware, there's computers, there's TVs. There's still money in her pocketbook. I felt that the violence was so over the top that it almost had to have some personal connection to it. And police quickly learned there was no one closer to Annalisa than her boyfriend, Nelson. We started contacting friends and family. We were talking to neighbors, and we were able to make that she was in a relationship with uh, Nelson Sessler. Uh, so immediately, that's put on our to-do list. Coming up, a loving boyfriend or a cold-blooded killer? I've seen people on scenes drop to their knees screaming and crying in disbelief that someone is dead. Why is this guy not completely distraught? Hours after finding Annalisa Raimundo murdered in her luxury condominium, investigators have a potential suspect, her boyfriend. Nelson Sessler. You're looking at domestic partners, especially such a violent crime like this, and you realize that you want to make contact immediately because such a violent, a bloody crime scene, there's no way that there wasn't transfer of blood to the attacker. But before officers can even begin searching for him, Nelson unexpectedly shows up at the crime scene. Up pulls this guy, and he wants to know what's going on in that condominium. Why do you want to know? That's my girlfriend slash fiance in there. There was, you know, no bloody clothing, uh, no scratch marks on his face. 
But that doesn't necessarily mean anything. They know the killer used the bathroom sink to wash the blood off, so now they're really interested to see what Nelson has to say. He said they were already engaged or they were about to get engaged, but they were definitely becoming more serious and they were talking about marriage and they had a very good relationship. They tell him, you know, that his fiance has been the victim of a homicide and they were struck by his reaction. It wasn't a typical grief or grieving type of action. It was very emotionless. If I'm told my fiance was just murdered, I'm gonna lose it. Nelson doesn't shed a tear. He kind of bows his head a little bit and sits there and he's kind of like, oh, geez, golly, I can't believe this happened. Despite his strange reaction, Nelson denies having anything to do with Annalisa's death. According to Nelson, the last time he saw her was the morning he was leaving for work. He said they'd made plans to get together again that night. She moved to another company in New Jersey. She was working from home a lot, traveling back and forth to New Jersey. He and Annalisa were supposed to go into the city to have drinks with a friend from Purdue Pharma. While police try to verify Nelson's story, his attitude does little to reduce their suspicions. They want to keep this guy contained. So they keep him in this lounge. And as they're going through the crime scene, they come back to him. He's sleeping. This guy was so laid back. Yeah, my girlfriend was just killed, but I'm going to go take a nap. They ask him for a DNA sample, which he voluntarily gives up. But the way he's acting is sending all kinds of red flags. But when investigators contact the pharmaceutical company, they confirm his alibi. The good thing about Purdue Pharma is they have a very extensive security system with cameras and a badge type of check-in. They were able to look at that time frame when this murder happened and see that Nelson was indeed at work, as he said. He had a very rock-solid alibi at that point that he was not the killer. With Nelson no longer a suspect, detectives turn their attention back to the missing female 911 caller. They asked Nelson if there were any women that he could think of that would want to hurt Annalisa. No one immediately comes to mind, but he does give police the name of two former girlfriends who both suffered from depression. Investigators quickly rule out both women, as well as the rest of Annalisa's family. They weren't anywhere near the condo at the time of the murder, and they didn't have a motive, but police did take a DNA sample just in case. We're doing uh, meticulous work, but we really don't have anything that we're really locked into. You start to look at, well, what's going on in this area of the condominium? Well, one thing they find out is a lot of the yachts parked near there are burgled. And they start looking at some of the people arrested for those crimes. Anyone that was arrested in the city of Stanford was being debriefed. Do they know anything about this? There was a great deal of frustration that we weren't making great headway in this investigation. Detectives' best hope for a lead comes from the DNA tests performed on the blood found in Annalisa's bathroom. The DNA hit comes back on a mixture both our victim and another person's uh, DNA. And again, you start looking for elimination, like you look for elimination fingerprints. They compared that sample to the exemplars they had with everyone they had talked to so far. As suspected, it didn't match Nelson or the victim's family. They submit that blood into CODIS, into all the systems, but comes up negative. If that person hadn't been arrested before, it's not going to pop up. It would either give a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down to any suspects that we developed later in this investigation. So it was certainly something we were very happy about and hopeful. But when months go by without any new developments in the case, those hopes begin to wane. There is no one left to interview at this point, and they still need more information on this mysterious 911 caller. It's like the investigation just comes to a halt at this point. You're just waiting for something to come in. It eats you up inside because you want answers for the family. You want justice. Coming up, 
news of another stabbing provides investigators with the break they've been looking for. And I was like, is there a female serial killer? What, you know, what's going on here? After five months of investigation into the murder of Annalisa Raimundo, Connecticut police seem to have reached a dead end. But on March 23, 2003, an incident in nearby New York changes that. I remember I came in the office and my editor was saying, you need to look into this. There was a stabbing in Westchester County and someone called and said they think it's related to Annalisa's death. Westchester Medical Center, Sunday night, some hospital employees were out on their break and they hear a scuffle in the uh, car park. It's dark and they can't be sure what they're seeing, but it appears to be a man and a woman who are engaged in a physical altercation. A security guard intervened, separated the two, and they called the police. The man was bleeding heavily from three stab wounds to the chest. Luckily, they were right outside of an emergency room, and he was able to be treated immediately. They got the suspect, who was the wife, in, and the Westchester authorities started questioning her. Uh, you know, they felt that they had an attempt at murder here. The victim's name is Paul Christos. His wife is 33-year-old Sheila Davalu. Sheila tells investigators that she and Paul had met as fellow students at New York Medical College in 1994, before getting married in May of 2000. They were rising up the ranks of their careers in college, getting master's degrees, doctorates, and they were good together. Sheila claims they have it all wrong. She was trying to help her husband, not hurt him. What time was it when he came home? Uh, I didn't notice him at first. I was playing with the dog, and then he came and he said he's hurt, and he laid on he laid on the floor, and he's like, "Can you look at it, see if it's bleeding?" I saw I saw the wounds in his chest. So was it was there blood around his body? There's definitely a lot of blood. Sheila claims they decided it would take too long for an ambulance to arrive, so she drove Paul to the hospital. If she and Paul weren't fighting in the parking lot, then what were they doing when the security guard had to separate them? And why did she take the time to park the car at all? Sheila, I have to be honest with you. I need off. The whole thing is odd. Meanwhile, doctors have stabilized Paul's condition. The first thing he does is ask to speak to police. Paul Christos is a strong guy. I mean, here's a guy who was stabbed three times, punctured lung, bled profusely, but he's talking. He wants to tell his story. Their marriage had not uh, apparently been doing well for a while. Um, you know, they were both academics, and, but they were kind of living separate lives. He was continuing on with school. She had this career. Paul says that when he came home earlier that day, Sheila suggested they try something new to reignite their relationship. He was still trying to work on this marriage, so when he's, you know, hearing, okay, we're going to play a sex game, he's, you know, all in for it. He describes some game he was playing with his wife, whereby they would blindfold each other and they would rub different objects on each other and the blindfolded person had to guess what the object was. He describes how he was blindfolded, tied to a chair, and his wife is rubbing objects on him, and all of a sudden he just feels this kind of thrust, this sharp pain in his chest. And he tells her, please, take the blindfold off. What's going on here? And he looks down and he sees blood. His wife says, oh, it was a candle, and there must have been some piece of metal sticking out of the bottom of the candle and it m cut you or something. He buys that, I guess. Paul's still in love with Sheila, and I think the fact that he's willing to still believe her despite how badly he's injured is a testament to that. He's like, okay, but I'm kind of losing blood and I'm, I'm getting dizzy. Call 911. He's in the chair listening to his wife as she describes, my husband is hurt, he's bleeding, and we need an ambulance here. They wait. 
Paul says they waited for what seemed like a very long time, but the ambulance never showed up. He begs his wife, put me in the car, take me to the ER. He's in the back seat. She pulls into the hospital park a lot and pulls around back. He's like, what's going on? She gets out of the car, comes over, opens the passenger door in the back. She has a knife in her hand. She begins to attack him. She stabs him again. And thank goodness this hospital employees were out there and heard what was going on. Now he knows something. He knows it wasn't a candle. His wife blindfolded him, strapped him to a chair, and then stabbed him. Investigators confront Sheila with her husband's testimony, but she denies trying to kill him. She admits to using a knife in their sex game, but she insists that she never meant to hurt Paul. Half the people decided a knife to somebody's chest by accident. Paul said he was safe again. On the way to the hospital. <laughs> But when detectives search the hospital parking lot, they find two damning pieces of evidence. They find a bloody kitchen knife and Sheila's cell phone, which she dropped during the struggle. When they search her call history, it's easy to see she's been lying to them. Sheila Davlu never called 911 for an ambulance. She never dialed the number. Instead, she called someone else in Stanford, and there were voicemails from that same number in return. It's a guy who is traveling down to Westchester County in order to meet Sheila that night for dinner and spend the weekend. So it's clear that she has a lover, and that man's name is Nelson Sessler. Coming up, detectives in New York and Connecticut join forces to solve the murder of Annalisa Raimondo. I think that he needed a shoulder to cry on, and so she kind of played into that. He was vulnerable. New York police suspect 33-year-old Sheila Davalu tried to kill her husband and make it look like an accident. But they're about to discover she's also connected to a different stabbing. She's been arrested and charged in New York at this point, and they know she's been having an affair with a man named Nelson, and they want to find out if he's involved as well. So an investigator makes the 45-minute drive from Westchester to Stamford. She heads up to Stamford, Connecticut, knocks on the door to his apartment. No answer. Knocks again. No answer. A neighbor hears the commotion and comes outside, and they just want to know if they found who murdered Nelson's fiance yet. Well, what are you talking about, murder? And so she pieces together right there that there's a murder in Stanford, and now she has a man stabbed in Westchester County, and that somehow these could be connected. She immediately contacts the detectives investigating Annalisa's murder. Hours later, Nelson Sessler is brought in for more questioning. Whether he was complicit or not is something we needed to find out. You know, the, the oddity of this attack, the oddity and the timing of this phone call. Nelson says all three of them worked at Purdue Pharma together. He briefly dated Sheila before he met Annalisa, but it was pretty casual, and that's why he hadn't mentioned her before. Sheila and Nelson had started seeing each other in 2001, but the relationship wasn't exclusive. Nelson, you know, is kind of casually dating Sheila Davalu at this point and starts to casually date Annalisa Ramunda. Until he got serious with Annalisa, and then that relationship ceased. Nelson claims he and Sheila had broken things off in 2002. He also admits that for the past two months, he had been seeing Sheila again but claims the affair hadn't begun until two months after Annalisa was killed. He was trying to get over the death of Annalisa, and I think like, he needed a shoulder to cry on, and so she kind of played into that. Nelson said that Sheila had reached out to him with a care package full of cookies and things like that. Then the next weekend, she invited him on a ski trip with some friends from work, but when he got there, it was just the two of them. Either he's really gullible or she's really smart. Maybe a little bit of both. But he, uh, you know, fell right into her trap and kind of rekindled their relationship. 
Nelson also claims he had no idea Sheila was married. She worked at Purdue Pharma in Stanford, Connecticut. The one thing Sheila didn't mention at Purdue Pharma was that she had a husband in Westchester County. She never told anyone about that. Nelson told police he had slept over her house several times, but he never saw any signs of anyone else living there. When investigators follow up with Sheila's husband, they find out why. He goes into a lengthy story about her having supposedly a disabled brother who would come and visit for the weekend. Sheila says, if my brother finds out I'm married to you, he's going to get really upset. He's very possessive that way. Paul felt sorry for her and for him. It's hard to believe, but he would clean out anything that would link him to the apartment, any pictures, clothes. He would go and stay with friends or in a hotel. Sheila would then have Nelson Sessler come over and sleep with him all weekend while Paul was at a hotel. In retrospect, it's easy for Paul to see his wife's deception, but he says it didn't stop there. Sheila, she had this whole story that she would tell Paul all the time, you know, about her friends at work, Melissa and Jack and Lisa, and uh, how it was a love triangle. She'd go home at night at the end of the day and say to Paul, I feel so bad for my friend Melissa. How can I help her? She's really put out. She's really heartbroken uh, because Jack is interested in this other woman. What do I do? Paul, at one point, had an interest in becoming an FBI agent. He had had some training and even some law enforcement equipment, like night vision goggles. He gave them to Sheila so she could help her friend. Of course, there is no friend. The relationship she's worried about is the one between Nelson and Annalisa. And it was at that time, really, when Sheila Davalu began stalking Nelson, using night vision goggles, following him. Once this came into focus, the level of it, obsession that Sheila had with Nelson and the different means that she would pursue him, it really became apparent that she wanted to take out the competition. When you look back at it, it's absolutely frightening. Nelson has already been cleared of any involvement in Annalisa's murder, and it's now clear to Stamford police that Sheila had plenty of motive to kill Annalisa. But did she have the opportunity? We know Purdue Pharma has a wonderful security system and that she worked there on that day. Was she working at this time? What we see is Sheila Davalu taking a long lunch on the day that Annalisa Raimondo was murdered. And during the time that the 911 calls made. So here's the opportunity. We played the call for so many of her family and associates, and there were a number of them that said, that's absolutely Sheila. The only thing left is to tie her to the crime scene, and that's where the DNA comes in. They already have samples from Annalise's apartment, and if Sheila is a match, that's pretty much ball game. The lab results come back with a conclusive match for Sheila's DNA. Now, in addition to the attempted murder of her husband, she is also charged with the murder of Anna Lisa Raimundo. Coming up, Sheila puts her defense in the hands of the only person she trusts, herself. She believes these grandiose thoughts of herself that, I can talk my way out of this. Everybody's going to believe me. In February of 2004, Sheila Davalu faces trial in New York for the attempted murder of her husband, Paul Christos. Prosecutors not only have the weapon and the eyewitnesses at the hospital, they also have Paul's direct testimony. Paul was a very good witness. He was very forthcoming. The attack at the hospital kind of locked into his mind that this was an attempt on his life. He had these loving feelings for her, so it was very upsetting for him to, like, know that the woman he married tried to kill him. The jury was sympathetic towards Paul, and the evidence was very strong. Sheila was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to 25 years in prison. Sheila serves nearly 10 years of her sentence before she is finally tried for the murder of Annalisa Raimondo. 
there's no statute of limitations on homicide or murder. So we had all the time in the world. Sheila's second trial begins on January 24th, 2012. Connecticut prosecutors argue that Sheila murdered Annalisa for the same reason she tried to kill her husband. It was all about her obsession with Nelson Sessler. She wanted him more than anything, but the feeling was not mutual. I think Sheila saw it as a relationship, whereas Nelson saw it as someone to sleep with. The jealous rage comes into play. We spoke about the overkill on the assault, the number of stab wounds, the bludgeoning. In addition to her husband's testimony, the state also has strong evidence to support their case. If Sheila Davalu didn't murder Annalisa Raimondo, why is her blood in Annalisa Raimondo's condominium? And that 911 call comes back up. Sheila definitely attempted to disguise her voice in that call. As years went on, and we had the luxury of time in this case, the technology uh, exploded in voice recognition, and we had experts again look into it, and they say, yes, that's definitely her voice. So the question always asked is, why did Sheila Davalu call 911 and not just go back to work? She's an ultimate narcissist. She cannot help herself from thinking that she can put the pawns in place to get away with something. When the time comes for Sheila's defense, she surprises everyone by deciding to represent herself. For as smart as this woman is, and the time she had spent studying, she just kind of fell flat on her face with the cross-examination. She seemed nervous. She seemed at many times like she didn't know where to go next with the questioning. The judge would very often uh, frustrated with the situation, overrule what she was saying. Her only hope was to try and discredit the evidence against her. She asked the jury if they thought her voice sounded anything like the one on the 911 tape. She also called the DNA results into question. She felt that it was a mistake or perhaps something that, uh, you know, we had orchestrated. She also tried to use the New York conviction as proof she was incapable of committing murder. If she were the one to kill Annalisa, then it stood to reason that she would have been able to finish the job with her own husband, especially since he was tied up and blindfolded. With Annalisa, there was rage. She went to her house, got in, there was a big struggle. You know, I think with Paul, it was like, you know, she had these mixed feelings. She's stabbing him, but yet she was helping him. She was stabbing him, but yet she was putting him in the car and taking him to the hospital. On February 10th, 2012, the jury announces their verdict. Sheila was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to an additional 50 years in prison. To hear that verdict and just a sense of of relief and you know really feeling good for the family that you know in a bad situation we had given them some amount of closure here and we had ascertained the truth in this investigation a scorned lover's need for revenge had torn apart several lives and ended the future of a promising young woman i have this vision in my head uh, of either the doorbell or a knock at the door and Annalisa looking through the peephole and seeing Sheila Davlo and kind of being quizzical like, well, that's odd, but recognize her and really feeling no threat. That's the sad part, that she opened the door for someone that she thought was a friend or, you know, someone that she knew and let them into her home. Sheila Davalu is really the ultimate narcissist. Still to this day, she'll tell you I had nothing to do with it. She even says, I will pray for Annalisa and her family. She's going to pray for the woman she murdered. That's a sociopath, and that's Sheila Davalu. Sheila Davalu.